Nothing goes quite together like an extremely religious pedophile group that have guns and the government. I'm talking about the Branch Davidians here. This group's beliefs started a siege that lasted weeks, and it's known as one of the most horrific and shameful sieges in all of modern history. And it was that bad that it led to the greatest shootout since the Cold War. Now, these guys were pretty damn weird, starting with the fact that they were religious to the point that they believed their leader was the final prophet and the apocalypse would come very soon. And what do people do when they believe their freedom is in question? If you said drink unlimited booze and eat chocolate till you throw up, you'd be kind of close, but not so true. Instead, these guys started stockpiling everything they could get their hands on that could kill someone. I'm talking pistols, rifles, grenades, and an ungodly amount of ammunition that would even make the US Army jealous. And in America, you could get away with a lot. But these guys were buying guns to the point where even the weapons dealers and the FBI were like, well, you guys, you guys gotta chill there. And if there's one thing a group likes more than guns, it's marrying people young people. The group's leader, David Koresh, thought about marrying a single person and thought, screw that. Instead, he just told everyone that he'd been given divine permissions to make multiple wives out of people, which in itself really isn't that harmful. I mean, whatever floats your boat. But the sad part is where the fact that several of these wives were as young as 12 to 14. He also had children with many of these, well, you know, which launched an investigation by the government. He claimed to not have these young wives for any explicit reasons, but instead so he could build a new lineage known as the House of David, which sounds like either a bad reality TV show or a gambling game. You see, living in the compound was also very strict. Almost everything was done with a schedule like praying, eating, and doing chores of which a lot were about growing food, since the compound was almost entirely self-sustained. Some people in the compound didn't even really agree with David's teachings, so there was always some sort of tension in the compound, even when there was no active threat. These guys also had their fair share of violence before the government even stepped in. Like when the predicted apocalypse was supposed to happen, most of the group just sold everything they had and built a few shacks and tents near the best site to survive in. But when the supposed doomsday arrived, nothing happened. Obviously, this led to a bunch of mad people, people dying, new people taking control. Y you get the idea. The group then split into two groups, which both believed in the same idea, but just thought of the other one as kind of annoying. The leader of these groups then challenged each other for the resurrection contest, which is as stupid as it sounds, as the police stepped in claiming they were abusing the corpse. This started the beef between the two groups and the police, but the main conflict itself started on February 28th of 1993. The Borough of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, also called the ATF, were planning on invading the compound to arrest its leader, David Koresh. But if anything, this raid showed how bad the government was at their job. Like, I mean, it was really bad. You're gonna see soon. You see, plans about this raid were actually leaked before they were even finalized, so when the ATF expected no one to know about the compound, they all kind of new. I didn't help that they themselves invited media to come and watch the spectacle that was about to unfold. The ATF set up their weapons and they patiently waited for the order to execute the search warrant. David said that he was willing to talk to the agents, so both groups started preparing for the worst, especially when David was getting ready to go outside. David opened the door, but right before he could walk outside, shots started being fired throughout the area. David then sprinted back inside and ordered his followers to open fire at the agents. To this day, no one knows exactly who fired the first shot, as both both groups said the other ones did it. But some people even claimed that shots were fired by the so-called dog team, which was sent to kill all the animals in the branch kennel, which is just horrible. But that didn't even matter in the moment. They just started a massive war that would last weeks and cost the lives of tens if not hundreds of people. Agents surrounded the entire building and began climbing up ladders to the roof in order to reach the compound's gun room. While making their way to the roof, several officers were shot and killed by the Branch Davidians and one was just wounded, just barely being able to crawl back to the ladder for safety. And then they started throwing stun grenades inside before entering the room. When one more agent tried to climb up, he was hit by a lot of enemy fire which unfortunately killed him. The agent had now successfully entered the armory, where they took out one of the Branch Davidians using a shotgun to the face. But when return fire hit one of the officers, he was killed. At this point, the officers were starting to get surrounded by the enemies, and it was only a matter of time until they would be too late to survive from them. They either had to try to surrender or risk making a push for survival. Gunshots were still being fired around them at all times as the agents outside could only wait for what was going to happen. The officers jumped up, killed a Branch Davidian, and started running to escape. Two of the officers were wounded during the escape while the third officer returned fire killing one of the people inside. They then made one final push to the exit where the third officer was hit in the head with a wooden beam that came falling from the roof. 
They managed to escape the building with help of an officer who started firing at the people still inside. And right when the trapped officer made it to safety, the officer outside was shot and killed instantly mainly by the enemies inside. This marked the end of the main assault, which lasted roughly 45 minutes. And at this point, the agents began to run out of ammo. In total, the shooting lasted around two hours, where a ceasefire was finally negotiated after four officers were killed, as well as five Branch Davidians. And after the embarrassing performance from the drug police, the big boys decided to step in. We're talking FBI level here. For starters, the FBI themselves offered to establish contact with David and others inside, which they agreed to. And it looked like things were already going a lot better than when it started. And it also ease the tension on both sides as they were dealing with casualties here. The case was handed to hostage rescue team commander Rich Rogers, who had been previously criticized for his actions at Ruby Ridge, but they would later see that the Waco incident was 100 times worse than the last one. As his second move in commandment, Richard overrode the site commander at Waco and ordered the blue and gold HRT teams to the same site. Which might not sound weird at first, but this created a lot of pressure to resolve the situation one way or another, since the HRT teams didn't really have enough reserves to keep the teams at the same site for long enough. So to speed things up, the FBI started using psychological warfare on the people in the compound. And these back and forward conversations of trying to get hostages out of the building, like for example, children, lasted for like weeks. And when I mean weeks, it was like a tense few weeks. They tried pretty much everything at a certain point. We're talking manipulation, pretty much anything you'll probably think of. Like for example, blasting gruesome sounds of bunnies being slaughtered and using extremely bright lights at night to keep those inside awake. While the FBI was busy doing FBI things, David was staying in contact with the local news as he gave phone interviews and updates on the situation. But then out of nowhere, the FBI decided that pff, screw that and straight up cut all contact between the compound and the outside world. Mainly because of negotiations and how the only reason David was allowed to do that in the first place was so that he would release hostages. And when David didn't release those hostages, it was pointless letting him keep those communications because that's what they wanted to cut off in the first place. This meant that there was no way for David and his followers to talk to anyone except the 25 FBI negotiators. In a later interview, it showed that negotiators criticized the commanders for cutting off negotiations and pretty much just making sure that all situations would end peacefully, which they were very successful at, well, mostly. In the following few days, tensions were still high around Waco, and neither side seemed to be willing to comply, and so the FBI believed they would finally make a breakthrough. David's goal was to show the entire world his message. So one of the FBI's negotiators, Agent Noser, wanted to use that to his advantage. The plan was for David to record a message which would be broadcasted on national television. And in return for that, he as well as the other Branch Davidians would peacefully surrender to the cops. The broadcast was made and then the FBI waited nervously for signs of movement in the compound. This could be the best chance to end the situation before it gets any way serious. And all it would take would be David to walk through the front door and finally the situation was over. Oh wait, no it's not? Oh. No, he didn't walk out the door in the end. Apparently, God told David to stay in the building and wait. But even with this uh, hiccup, the FBI still managed to negotiate the release of 19 children, which were both between a few months to 12 years old. The parents, however, were still in the building, actually 98 to be fact, and the children were interviewed by the FBI and allegedly they had been physically and mentally abused long before the standoff. This started the biggest conflict of the entire event, as on April 19th, nine Bradley tanks carrying tear gas grenades made it to the compound. The tanks then started driving across and crushing pretty much everything they could find, like fences and cars belonging to the Davidians. The Davidians were getting pretty upset with the FBI and the, even the negotiators were getting mad at them for doing horrible jobs. And the main assault then started when tanks made holes in the building and started pouring tear gas inside to lure the Davidians out. The FBI had planted listening devices at this point and they were hearing conversations inside the compound like have they poured it yet and don't pour it all out we need some later. It was suspected they were talking about fuel which they were planning to blow up the compound with. But then it seemed like someone was finally surrendering. He walked outside but right before surrendering he threw away his phone and sprinted back in. At this point, the entire building was gassed, yet no one came out. More conversations were being held from inside the compound, and this time it seemed clear they were talking about setting themselves on fire. The fuel has to go all around to get started. Many more tear gas rounds were being shot into the building now, but it didn't seem like anyone was leaving. Shortly after this, however, a banner appeared saying the Davidians wanted their phones fixed. It seemed like they were finally willing to talk to the FBI about surrendering, but this is not what the government claims. 
Instead, they claim things were being said like, I want a fire and keep that fire going. And the fire, they got. Signs of smoke were starting to come out of the building, and shortly after, the entire thing burst into flames. There was no way to save those still inside, even though fire trucks were still arriving. At this point, almost 100 people, including more than 20 children, died, and this finally marked the end of the standoff as David Koresh was pronounced dead. If you want more information on this, there's actually a full documentary on Netflix, which is really good. So if you want to watch that, go ahead. And if not, and you want to keep watching some videos, watch our ones. It's on screen right now. They're pretty good. Pretty funny. Right. Bye-bye.